All right, I'm going to um, go ahead and get started. I think a few more folks might trickle in, but we've got a good crowd. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Funding Consciousness Research uh, using the Register Reports format. This is, I'm going to share my screen and give a couple of introductions, and uh, we'll have plenty of time to go over the details of the initiative, what the workflow looks like for funding and publication, and the great partnerships that are forming throughout this. So here we go. You should all see uh, my PowerPoint slides here. So again, thank you very much everyone for um, joining us today. Uh, the slides will be made available and links to all the resources that we're mentioning and instructions are coming uh, to anybody who registered to this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank, in particular, uh, our panelists, Lucy Charles and Zoltan Dines. Um, I'll be giving a little bit more complete introductions in just a moment, but thank you everyone for participating, and thank you to the Templeton World Charity Foundation for supporting this initiative, and links to those um, resources will also be available on the website. Today we're going to talk about the uh, initiative and how the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness is working with us on uh, expanding the register report format to this research community. Then in particular, how neuroscience of consciousness, which has been accepting register reports, as old as you might have to correct me, but for several years now, three or four years now, I believe, um, how they are, um, how they manage the workflow and, and what to expect when submitting a register report. Then I will, take over and talk about some of the funding expectations, what to include in budget, how to submit pre-submission inquiries to us, and what to do if you are looking to publish in um, one of the other partner journals in the peer community in registered reports. And finally, we'll have Q&A time at the end. If you have a clarifying question, uh, please put that in the chat at any time. Um, if you have any question, put that in the Q&A feature also at any time, and we'll make sure to get to um, all the big questions at the end. But if there's any points that we are unclear about during the presentation, we'll, um, we'll interrupt it and, and clarify that right at that point. So again, thank you to Lucy Charles, Executive Director of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness and Fellow at the British Academy. Um, it's been a great partner in helping us or figure out all the logistics and get a great advisory panel together to help us with our work in supporting this research. And Zoltan Dines, Professor of Psychology at the University of Essex and the Registered Reports Editor at the, um, our main journal partner, Neuroscience of Consciousness. So thank you very much. My name is David Meller. I'm the Director of Policy here at the Center for Open Science in the USA. Um, at this point, I'll pass the baton to Lucy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and she can talk about the ASSC and the expertise that is joining us from them. Sure. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so welcome everyone. Thanks very much for joining. It's very nice to see uh, not familiar faces, but familiar names. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Um, so as I said, um, as David said, I'm the executive director of the SSC, and I'm very, very happy today to be uh, kind of introducing uh, this scheme uh, to you uh, in collaboration with the Center for Open Science and the Templeton uh, Foundation. So I'm just going to say a few words about the SSC. Uh, hopefully most of you know the association, um, but just for, for some of you who might not know, the SSC was founded in 1994. And um, the core goal of uh, this academic society is to promote rigorous research towards uh, understanding the nature, function, and underlying mechanisms uh, of consciousness. And really what's at the core of the society is um, pluridisciplinarity. Um, we have members working in the field of cognitive science, medicine, neuroscience, philosophy, and many other uh, relevant disciplines um, in the science and humanities. 
Um, and the first conference of the ASSC happened in 1997. And since 2007, we have a official journal. It changed <laughs> across the years, uh, but um, that's one of the core activity uh, of, of the ASSC. Um, and just to describe a bit more uh, what we've been doing, uh, mainly the SSC organized a yearly conference. Uh, a last in-person conference was uh, in 2019, quite a long time ago now, in Canada, London, Ontario. Um, and we had to cancel the 2020 meeting, but we had a wonderful virtual meeting in 2021 organized by um, the uh, Tel Aviv uh, organizing uh, committee and we're very pleased that this year we have uh, again a first a, a first in-person meeting after a long time uh, in Amsterdam uh, that will be in July uh, and next year will be in New York City so if you're interested please uh, look at the website and register for um, the this year's meeting uh, so really the core of the SSC is organizing uh, these conferences um, and again having uh, many different scientists of different fields kind of meeting to discuss consciousness research. We also have um, the William James Prize that we uh, give for paper um, every year. And this is for an outstanding uh, contribution to the field of consciousness research. And again, what's at the core of this is pluridisciplinarity. And for that reason, um, the William James Prize is uh, given alternatively each year, either to theoretical or empirical uh, contribution. And as I was saying, we also have um, uh, official journal. This is Neuroscience of Consciousness. Um, so Dan will tell you maybe a bit more about the journal later. Um, and uh, we don't directly publish the proceeding of uh, the conference in the journal, but uh, the idea is that it really we work with the journal uh, in close proximity and the members of the SSC uh, are encouraged to publish um, their work in the journal. Um, and we both, uh, work closely with uh, the editor Anil Seth as well for developing initiative um, through this. So this, these are the, the core activities uh, of the SSC that you might have heard um, uh, uh, about already, but you probably have seen that the fields of consciousness uh, research has been um, evolving and there's been a lot of reflection about um, what we do as uh, scientists working on consciousness in the recent years. You might have heard of the consciousness theory study database, for instance, uh, which lists uh, different, uh, all the different papers um, on the topic of uh, theories of consciousness across the years. And this um, has maybe revealed to us that there are some shortcoming or biases um, in the type of papers that are published on theories of consciousness. Um, and I think this is uh, not just this paper, but also a growing feeling that uh, maybe there are things that we can do to improve consciousness research. Um, and we're very much uh, appreciative of the initiative of the Templeton Foundation uh, for accelerating research on consciousness and in particular the initi initiative of adversarial collaborations that you might have heard of uh, with the idea of having different supporters of theories of consciousness um, uh, confronting really the theories. Uh, the SSC very much support these initiatives um, and indeed at this year's conference um, in Amsterdam we're going to have the great consciousness debate where several of these uh, supporters of theories of consciousness are going to present these theories and debate directly um, to kind of uh, really create progress in the field um, and not uh, just um, uh, kind of stay uh, within one uh, uh, kind of community of, uh, of, uh, of uh, thoughts about uh, the theories of consciousness. So these and the initiatives uh, that the ASSC uh, participate in, but we were really, really excited to uh, see the Center for Open Science and Templeton uh, kind of uh, contact us and link up to also favor open science um, in consciousness research and really develop an open science of consciousness with the idea of uh, promoting transparency and rigor uh, in consciousness research through registered reports. Um, and I think uh, the idea of this scheme and in particular to provide funding for uh, registered reports is to empower consciousness researchers to use open science practices and here I'm thinking in particular to junior scientists um, who might uh, not 
have access to uh, this more um, larger source of funding uh, for consciousness research. Uh, and I think it's particularly important that junior scientists do submit uh, some of um, uh, their registered report to this call because uh, you are really the next generation of scientists that are going to promote uh, this um, higher standards and, and new standards uh, in consciousness research. And um, the second thing that I wanted to, to say is that uh, we very much hope that um, the ASSC in Amsterdam will be the occasion to also develop collaboration um, uh, and uh, submission for this scheme. So uh, I think Zoltan is going to talk a tiny bit more uh, about um, uh, the registered reports, but um, I also wanted to point out that he's going to have a tutorial on um, uh, registered reports at the conference. And I think David and uh, myself and many more will be able to answer your questions at the conference as well. So that will be the occasion to um, hopefully um, create collaboration and have uh, people to ask questions directly um, to, to encourage the submissions. So I think I'm probably over time a bit, but the last thing that I wanted to say is that we're really lucky to have several of our board members who agreed to be on the review committee for this scheme. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, these are uh, scientists, of course, expert in the field uh, of consciousness and uh, will decide basically whether the registered reports are uh, in the scope of consciousness research. So obviously, if your submission is going to neuroscience of consciousness, um, you don't really have a problem uh, in the sense of, of the scope, but because many other journals are part of this um, scheme, uh, we think we saw that it would be good to have a kind of first review um, of the submissions before they go to the registered reports. So I'll stop here. I hope I wasn't too long um, and I very much uh, looking forward uh, to hearing your questions um, about the scheme. Timing was perfect. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I'm going to pass to uh, Sultan now to describe the Retro Report process um, at Neuroscience of Consciousness. So Sultan, take it away. If, if I may, I'll, I'll describe also peer community in. Is that okay, David? Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely fine. Because there's um, when you submit, there's um, there were two routes. You can you can either go to neuroscience of consciousness as the um, as the society's journal, and, and obviously the remit of the journal is exactly the remit uh, that uh, is wanted for this for this scheme. Um, another thing you can do is to um, submit to peer community and registered reports, which has been going about a year. Um, and um, over the year, we've we've had um, about fifty submissions that um, uh, that we're dealing with. And uh, what happens is, peer community in registered reports, in a way that's free for the author, uh, free for institutions, um, free for the reader. Um, it, it it takes the submission through the registered reports uh, process uh, all the way. Um, using archived uh, submissions. Uh, and then we have a, a list of um, PCI, RR, Peer Community and Registered Reports friendly journals. As there's more than 20 of them, which, which includes some that was just listed on the previous slide. My Psychology of Consciousness is a obviously relevant one. Uh, Royal Society, Open Science, Cortex, uh, and, and many others that, that, that could be relevant. They have committed to uh, accepting the papers that have been through the, the PCI RR process uh, as, um, as as registered reports, um, uh, pe pending though that any uh, author processing charges uh, AP, APCs and any other specific requirements of the journal, like specific power levels um, or, or other uh, uh, criteria that um, that we give, uh, have been satisfied. So what you can do is e e either submit to Neuroscience of Consciousness or you go to PCIRR. PCIRR takes you through the process um, and then you have the choice at the end of that as to which journals um, you may wish, if you wish, it can stay in the PCIRR system. It's been fully reviewed uh, and, and um, edited, recommended, as we say. But, but if you wish, you can then go to one, one of any of the 20-odd journals. Um, 
Now, David, I'm right in saying if it goes through that route, the PCIRR, that's when it goes to the a, it goes to you and the ACSC committee for vetting as to topic appropriateness. Yeah, the, um, the yeah, yeah, the the the, the pre submission comes to us for for vetting and focus, um, uh, just to make sure that the uh, the scope is within the right remit. Um, correct. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, the main thing I wanted to talk about is some some of the things that. Um, are not in place in an initial registered report submission, uh, just so that uh, you, you know about that. But there are just a couple of features of the PCI RR system I just want to highlight because it's different from anywhere else. Um, one is that we do a scheduled review, PCI RR, uh, meaning you, you put in a very short description, you send to us a very short description of what your stage one, your initial submission will look like. Uh, and we send it out to reviewers and say, in six weeks' time, in a five-day window, do you commit to reviewing the paper in that time? Absolutely commit. There's no exceptions. You have to do that in that five-day window. Uh, and then in that six weeks, um, you as authors have a chance to write up the manuscript, give it to us a week before that five-day window, and then we send it out and we have guaranteed reviews uh, back um, within a week or two. Um, and about half our submissions at PCIR have, have been through that process and it's worked as, as advertised. So um, that's one feature. Not, another feature I just want to mention because it could well be relevant to you is uh, typically a registered report involves a single study. It might involve a pilot study, which is always recommended, but then the registered report part of that, uh, in which you're pre-registering you know, this particular study, um, is, is typically one study. Uh, we have programmatic RRs where you can, at the initial submission, um, go through, the, go through the, the review process for a set of studies, which can each have the individual papers or, or be published all at once. Okay. Um, so now when, when you uh, submit a registered report, I want to talk about registered reports in general now. Uh, I found a very common way psychologists and other people think about experiments is they say, I wonder what will happen if I do this. I wonder what will happen if I do manipulate this thing. Let's see what happens. Now, uh, wonder in a scientist is a, is a fine thing, of course. But that's, that's not quite the, the sort of the attitude uh, you want to have um, by the time you get to a registered report, report. That might be appropriate, say, and, and, and good. It's, it's not that that's not good, that's fantastic and, and how, you know, how, how science works. Uh, but that would be an exploratory report in, in Cortex. And it could be the basis of a pilot study, uh, which you do. And, and if you're thinking of going, uh, going for a registered report through this, through this uh, system or any other, it would be good to do a pilot study. But then what you, what you want to have uh, on the table is uh, some clarity about what claims are at stake in terms of why you're doing this registered report. Um, what are you putting on the line when you do this? So um, if you, uh, there'll probably be some, some interesting general bold claim. There may not be, but there'll probably be something you could regard as a substantial theory. So uh, it, uh, something like that could be, for example, int uh, extrinsic motivation kills intrinsic motivation. That's sort of a, a general idea that's not quite testable as stated, is, is a bit too abstract. But it's, but it's, um, uh, it, it's sort of a bold and interesting idea. And, and then through some assumptions, you can come to a more specific claim, like um, if I reward children for eating the broccoli, they won't like it so much because of the reward. So you're, you're now making a, a, particular, a particular prediction. Um, so now um, you, you define some particular dependent variables, uh, ratings of liking, and what your manipulation will be, what the rewards will be, and so on. Now, now when you do this, you're going to make certain assumptions, like, for example, that the rewards you use are genuine extrinsic motivations um, for, the, for the subjects in question. 
Um, and there's going to be, for, for a, um, a, a given prediction like that, there's going to be, you need to think about what's a specific test, a specific test um, that would test that claim, that prediction. So, so children given, um, given sweets for eating broccoli versus those not given sweets um, will like the broccoli less after two weeks. So that's some specific claim. Then you might say, well, I'll do a t-test um, to do that or, or whatever it is that you want to do. So what you need to think about is what is the specific test for each specific claim that, um, that you're going to make. Now, as I said, when, whenever you do that, you're making some assumptions um, and um, registered reports are pretty hot on manipulation checks and checks of assumptions. So if you wanted the data to count against um, the general claim or the specific claim about eating, eating broccoli and sweets, um, what is it that needs to be assumed um, and how can you check that? Uh, like, as I said, that the, that the, in this case, can you test that the rewards are rewarding or, or ex extrinsic motivations for the, for, the, um, for, the, for the subjects in question? Or if, you, if you're claiming that uh, some distracted task is more difficult or demanding than another distracted task, what will be your test that the task is more difficult than, another, than the other task? So you, need to, you need to list these, and you probably will need some manipulation checks and more generally what we call outcome-neutral tests. In other words, tests that make sure the experiment will do its job um, of testing the substantial theory or the main claim that you're, you're actually interested in. So um, in, in your registered report, um, you need to list the specific hypotheses the manipulation checks and the um, the main claims um, that you that you are testing. So be very clear about the claim that is tested. It's not I wonder if this is going to happen. It's going to be this group will be larger than that group uh, on on this variable. And and those claims will then line up with specific tests. You see. So if if you're if you're predicting a linear trend. The higher the voltage goes in some experiment, then the more some, something else will happen. The, the test of that is a linear trend. Uh, and, and in general, you'll probably find, not always, but the test that you're interested in is a one degree of freedom test, because most predictions amount to one degree of freedom. So the appropriate uh, uh, analysis for, for testing a linear trend is you don't need to do the omnibus overall F or the overall ANOVA. You just say you're going to do the linear trend. You specify this is this is the claim. There will be a linear trend. Well, then you you that's what you're going to test. That's what you're going to specify is the linear trend uh, when you specify the analysis. So make sure you've very clearly listed each hypothesis, including the manipulation checks, uh, and, and then you've associated with each of them the specific test that tests that claim. Now, what you need to be able to say as well is what would count against the claim. So the, the experiment can only do its job of testing theory if data can count against it. And that, that, that applies to manipulation checks as well. We need to know what data would count against the manipulation check. So if you're proposing equivalence of something, that two groups need to uh, have the same level of expectation, mindfulness, whatever it is, um, you, you need a test of equivalence um, to support it and test, test a difference to go against it. And, and if you're predicting a difference, uh, you need to be able to get evidence for equivalence to go against that, that claim, as well as evidence for difference to, to, to go with it. So the sort of the, the rather standard practice of simply doing significance tests and finding something significant and something not, and that's all you do, it isn't, isn't, isn't going to work. That isn't going to do the job. Um, so, how can you do the job? Well, if you want, if you want to be able to assert or get evidence for equivalence, which is what's necessary here, um, there's a number of things you do. And the, and the three main ones is you can work with power. You can say I've got enough power to pick up what would be a minimally interesting effect. And then, no, the other is base factors, and the other is some form of equivalence testing. But those are three. That's not exhaustive, but those are the, 
the main three. So you'll probably be picking one of those three. Uh, and, and that means you need to show the sensitivity um, of your test with respect to finding equivalent results or different results. In other words, how severely are you testing these claims that you've, um, that you've laid out? Now, power, uh, power is used to, used to control um, the error of saying something is not there when it is there. And it's controlled with respect to the effect size you put into the power calculation. So what that means is you, only can, you, you can only make claims about what isn't there um, up to the limit of the effect size you put into power calculation. What that means is you need to specify a minimally interesting effect size uh, for your power calculation to make sense, uh, scientific sense, uh, in getting a non-significant result to count against uh, the claims that it's meant to count against. Um, for a base factor, you need to have some sense of what's the expected effect size you're trying to pick up. That's the main thing you'll need to specify. If you're doing some sort of equivalence test, either Bayesian or frequent test, you need to specify a, 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 a region of um, sort of meaninglessness. Effect size in this region are too small to be theoretically or practically interest, interesting to the question uh, that you're dealing with, the claim that you're dealing with. And that means you need to specify minimally interesting effect size again. And then you're going to say whether your confidence interval or credibility interval lies within that region at the end of it or outside of it or uh, spans both and is, and, is, and is inconclusive. So then you need to work out if you're doing um, that sort of equivalence testing is how many subjects would you need to have the confidence interval be able to, in principle, sit completely within the region? Can you run that amount of subjects? Same for a base factor. Um, having specified what, what, a, what, what effect is relevant in this context for the theory or claims that you're testing. So a default base factor or a default anything um, is, is, not, is not a sufficient ground for doing it. So a, a default effect size, by default base factor, I mean you're using a default predicted effect size, but there's no such thing as a default predicted effect size in a scientific context. So, so any... Um, um, default models that you use, you, you have to say why that model is relevant to your particular experiment. You have to justify it scientifically. Now, when, when you actually do this, it typically turns out um, you need more subjects than is typically run in that field. Uh, and that shouldn't be terribly surprising, given all the papers that um, habitually come out decade after decade about how so many fields are radically underpowered. So the fact that when you get to think about it in advance and really do this well and have your, have your reasoning checked by reviewers and editors and talked about to make sure it's solid, it's not just uh, constructed post hoc after running an experiment, that you end up needing more subjects than people often typically put in the first submission uh, and at least more than is typically done in that field. Um, so I'd say that's, that's the biggest thing to, to, to think about. Um, is, is making sure that the tests that you do are scientifically relevant to the claims that you're putting forward. Uh, and uh, the way that statistical tests become scientifically relevant is when you're modeling what could be there or what's interesting in a way that's relevant to the science that, that you're dealing with. Uh, and then that leads to you proposing a certain number of subjects, which is going to be really relevant to this initiative because um, you're going to have to say how much money you need, uh, and that's going to depend a lot on how many subjects you have to run. Have I run out of time now? Yeah, uh, and that, that's a good um, segue because we, we, the, yeah. the, the budgetary question um, is one that's going to come up quite frequently in terms of what the proposed sample sizes are based on the um, scientific relevance and how we'll be looking out for that through the review process. There are two questions that have come in. I think uh, mm -hmm. it might be okay to. Um, I think it would be good. I think there is one question from Aaron Scherger that might be quite relevant to what you were just saying, Zoltan. Okay. So he's asking are well designed data driven or exploratory studies out of the questions here? So, how much a registered report can kind of be exploratory? Uh, what, what would be your answer? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not sort of designed to be exploratory, but, but there, is, there is a sort of um, 
a new nuance to that. I mean, some people might think that exploratory involves estimating parameter sizes and not testing hypotheses. And, and there have been registered reports where there, weren't, there wasn't hypothesis testing, either Bayesian or Fuentes, it was, but it was estimating a parameter. You just wanted to get an unbiased estimate of a certain parameter. I don't know if you count that as exploratory, but that is a, that's still a fine thing for a registered report uh, okay. because you're, you're trying to take the bias out of the procedure by which this parameter is, 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 is estimated. So that certainly can be done. But if you're just saying, um, I've got this whole bunch of dependent variables and I'm wondering what happens if I do, if I, if I do this manipulation, that, that's, I would say that's not quite relevant for a registered report. Yeah, so, or, or those preliminary exploratory findings can and should be used to justify um, the submission or, or part of the, um, the rationale for the submission. And any exploratory results that, that, that come up throughout the process can and should be reported um, as exploratory or unpredicted uh, tests, but, but not as the, the main focus of the registered report. Yeah. So, there is, so just to clarify, so there is room, um, so you can register a report with the planned analysis and then still report in the final paper some postdoc analysis that might be uh, clearly labeled as postdoc after you have reported the kind of core uh, of the, the analysis that you registered. Yeah, so you can, you can do any analysis you want in, in the final stage too, but as you say, it's in a separate section. Uh, a non-pre-registered analysis section. Uh, the, the, the only what one proviso though is when it comes to summarizing results in the abstract, uh, the the, re the pre-registered uh, analytic protocol is the one that should uh, maybe only, but certainly primarily, dominate the the abstract uh, and the conclusions there. And the same in in the discussion, you should focus on um, what was registered, so that that comes to guide. Um, the, the firm conclusions, or as firm as they can be from the paper. But of course, you can still discuss and conduct exploratory analyses, just they'll just be labeled as such. Right. I think there was another interesting question. Um, so from Matthias Lobo, who said he's a physicist, a mathematician, and he asked, does consciousness research include data analysis coming up from dreams while sleeping and connecting to one's own consciousness and or external facts somehow connected to those dream reports? My feeling is that that sounds perfectly relevant for consciousness research, but uh, as editor in a neuroscience of consciousness, Zoltan, would you, would you think that would be suitable? Uh, dreams would be a fine topic for, for consciousness research, um, yeah. So I think suitable topic, the question would be, can you actually make it as a registered report as we discussed? A registered report as a, as a case study um, involving yourself might be hard, I think, um, for reasons of being blind to the hypothesis and um, just sort of for reasons of experimental rigor. Um, I mean, I don't know the details of it, of, of the study that you have in mind. It, it, it sounds like that would be a difficult one, to be honest. But what, but what you could do is um, have a case study on yourself as a sort of pilot and see if that motivates any further ideas to do with dreaming that you could run as a sort of a more controlled study on, on, um, on other subjects. Mm -hmm. We do have more questions, but let me... Um give a couple of more details about some of the um, workflow and requirements. And then we'll, we'll make, we, we have all these captured. So we'll um, make sure to either get them at the end or absolute worst case scenario, we'll write them down and um, put, post them on the website. But a lot of great questions coming in. So please make sure we, we'll, we'll make sure we get those answered. Oh, no, I messed up one more time. <laughs> there we go. So I just wanted to emphasize that all the materials that I'm going to be pointing out in the next few minutes are available on our website, cos.io slash consciousness. Uh, frequently asked questions, any additional questions that arise from the webinar that we're not able to answer live, we can post there as well. And links to the pre-submission inquiry budget template and all the participating journals are available there as well. 
when deciding to submit, the, the, the first thing to do on that website is the pre-submission form. And this just allows us a couple of different um, important checks to, of course, um, make sure that the content is relevant for the scope of work that we that are that is to be supported. And that's where um, I'll, I'll point out where in the workflow, that's where the advisory panel comes in. It also helps us keep an eye on the um, budgetary expectations. So we, um, I'll, I'll give some parameters for that in the next few slides, um, but we're um, hoping to hit the target on that. The pre-submission form, of course, has some demographic information about yourself, uh, question about what the expected timeline for your study is, where you expect to submit your results to or your, your registered report to. And the most important part of the pre-submission form is the structured abstract. A little bit of background, what the specific objective and hypotheses are, what methods you'll use, and then finally, some acknowledgement and understanding of what the expectations of the funding is. Uh, we'll be involved with the review process, again, to be on the lookout for any changes that, ch that affect the proposed budget. Um, and there also are not only rich reports, but high open science expectations and requirements um, uh, for all materials and all data generated as, as part of these studies. So to the greatest extent, that's a uh, allowed ethically without compromising um, subject confidentiality or anything like that. Uh, all the underlying data and materials and or data analysis process um, has to be publicly available as part of the, um, the as one of the conditions of, of funding for these. So the basic timeline is that you submit the application, the, the pre-submission inquiry. Uh, we'll be checking to make sure that those are within the appropriate scope, thanks to the support of the ASSC Advisory Committee. Um, and that can go either directly to neuroscience of consciousness or to um, many of the uh, partner journals uh, in the peer community and register report process. Um, as Zoltan mentioned, though that process has a couple of different options where you can schedule a review if you want quick feedback, but you have to commit to a six-week timeline of getting it to them. Or it can be th through their normal recommendation process of posting it and then requesting review. Um, and that goes through their process. Sorry, one moment. There's some graphic noise. Upon in-principle acceptance, either through the peer community in format or at Neuroscience of Consciousness is when um, funding will be made available. So if it has a approval from us, from the pre-submission inquiry, if we've been monitoring the, any changes that occur during the uh, review process that might affect budget, uh, the, the award will be given at that stage one um, in principle acceptance in order to support the uh, proposed and accepted research design. Um, that will you know, permit conducting of the study and then um, as normal, uh, you know, publish the results uh, approximately in line with the proposed timeline. Um, of course, subject to experimental realities. The funding and budget, we, we anticipate between 30 and 75 uh, awards being made upon in principle acceptance. Uh, we expect most of those to be between 15 and 20,000 US dollars. Um, there's, an, there's an absolute maximum of, of 50,000 US dollars. Um, and of course, that would limit the total number of, of, of awards. And we're encouraging uh, budget templates to include mostly research materials and particip participant support. Um, and, and less so on researcher um, time or, or um, salary support. The budget template is available. Uh, there's a link to it on the COS website um, and, the, and the template and other materials that are available for download are available on OSF for doing so. Um, and there is option to store all digital materials, data, and a local code or any supporting information um, on live OSF projects and upon in principle acceptance, um, those can be registered. So that, that creates that permanent read only version of the research plan through the OSF registry. 
Um, I won't go into too much detail because Zoltan gave um, a fabulous overview of the peer community and register reports. Primarily, I'll be pointing to the great materials that they have available on their website, rr.peercommunityin.org. The workflow that they um, allow includes the submission of the um, research plan. Again, after that's given a, a pre-approval by us through the submission form. Um, and then the, the preprint, it's managed through um, uh, revisions of uh, posted preprints. And so the stage one proposal is version one of a preprint and that might go through, Zoltan, you might correct me, but two or three or, or maybe occasionally more rounds of review as uh, reviewer feedback comes in. I'm not sure what you would say is typical in stage one. Are you able to uh, give an estimate there? Yeah, just like a normal submission at a journal, really, maybe three rounds. Is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I've uh, seen and expected also. Um, and then again, upon recommendation by the PCI community, that is the equivalent of in principle acceptance, of course. Um, and that's the point at which um, funds can be distributed. Uh, as Altan mentioned, also the, the the key feature, one of the one of the many key features um, of the PCI register report community is they've got a list of a large list of PCI um, register report friendly journals. They commit to accepting the proposed uh, and the accepted manuscript without any further um, um, scientific review. So th there might be a couple of additional requirements that a journal indicates about word limits or ensuring that the, um, the, the scope of work is, is appropriate for what they are able and willing to publish. Um, but, but they do commit to generally um, accepting those uh, PCI endorsed uh, studies and manuscripts. Um, and here's a complete list of those PCI friendly journals. Um, and again, we'll be posting a link to that on the website so you have um, clarity on what all of those journals are. Um, but many of these are obviously appropriate for um, consciousness research. But as we mentioned a couple of times, it, it is appropriate, it is important that we um, have the pre-submission check just to make sure that the proposed work is within scope of what we're able to support. It's a little bit redundant right now, but all information is going to be available and is available on the Consciousness Research website. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we'll get back to, I think all of the great questions that have been coming in. I think we have about a good backlog of uh, five or six questions. So let me stop sharing and we can work through that. So I think there was a couple of questions about journals um, that maybe we could, so someone is asking um, whether any of the PLOS journal would be possible submission avenues, David, what do you think? Not at this time. Um, if those do become available, we'll make sure that that's um, uh, prominently listed on the consciousness website. But um, for the time being, the, the ones listed on cos.io slash consciousness are the eligible outlets. And Andy Deska is asking, how about the PCIRR interested journals? So I think um, journals that might be um, may be coming into <laughs> yeah I, exactly and, and if you're familiar with the peer, uh, peer community and journals uh there's another group of journals that um look favorably upon those that have been recommended by the peer community and um review process again at this time no only um neuroscience of consciousness and the pci friendly journals are those that are eligible those are great questions, by the way. So thank you for asking. I up a couple of questions I, I noticed there. One, one was from Aaron. He, he asked, um, let's say you have a bunch of five theories or explanations and your experiment's going to distinguish between them. The, the, there isn't any prediction, he says. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question because that's because from a scientific point of view, I think what's, what's relevant is the relationship between each of those explanations and the predictions they make. So when you say there's no predictions, that means you don't have a prediction. But I, I, I personally have this rule. I never end an introduction by saying I predict that because I regard that as scientifically irrelevant. I say based on this theory, this is predicted. But based on that theory, that could be predicted because that's what's scientifically relevant. 
Uh, so what I predict, who cares? Um, so yes, um, yeah, that is perfectly suitable for a registered report. You say, you know, theory one predicts this, but theory two predicts this, and theory three predicts that. That's fantastic. That's precisely what we want. And in fact, uh, what I think we should all be aiming to do in, in every registered report we could do. Um, so you're theme. saying David's theory of consciousness is not the, uh, the, the, the relevant one to include there? <laughs> Um, hopefully <laughs> but it was not what was it was there another question for me i think oh, yes, I yeah, yeah. i just want to say something about qualitative methods yeah um yeah. I, I think one of the very the very first on, on pcir one of the very first papers we accepted at stage one gave in principle acceptance two was it was was a qualitative methods paper so from a registered reports point of view that that, that we, we can actually do that um but now from the point of view of this particular initiative and what the ACC wants, I'll ask Lucy and David. So qualitative it's, methods. It's not out of scope. Um, we don't, I don't quite anticipate it, um, but it is certainly something that we would consider if you're, if you, um, if you're proposing a, a qualitative methods um, study, I, I think that should be submitted at least as the pre-submission inquiry. And we'll take a more specific look about um, your, both the scope and, and methods. And if it's um, something that can be published as a, as a registered report, as Zoltan said, that's, that, that is feasible. Um, and if the discipline's scope uh, looks appropriate, yeah, we would, we would accept. We would um, be, be very happy to have those submissions. Um, mm -hmm. Lucy, do you have any? No, I think I, I, I agree, yeah. And Razvan had a question, does he need to do a pilot if he's mm -hmm. say, following on from a particular study uh, with some, modif some modification to test some theory? You don't need a pilot to do a registered report. Um, but because um, you're committing yourself to certain analytic protocol, I, I, I personally do, do recommend it. So you've had some experience in playing around with, with that sort of data, but it's not necessary and lots of papers don't have, have pilots. Um, I, yeah, and I would um, in, encourage sort of pilot as feasibility. Um, it's not it's not a requirement, um, but as the submissions are, um, you know, both asking for financial support and uh, you know, publish the final final results um, as a registered report, um, some sort of demonstration that the proposed methods are are feasible can be done, and there is an ability to do so. Those do would make a stronger submission. I think there are a couple of questions about the timeline and duration of projects. Maybe that David, you can yeah. comment on. So the funding is available through 2024, but we, we obviously the um, uh, you know we anticipate that the submissions will uh, primarily occur this year. So um, July is the ASCC in-person conference, and um, as Lucy mentioned, we will be there to. A, answer more questions about the process and um, raise more awareness about it. And so we, we do anticipate that in the few months following the July ASSC conference would be the um, main window for submission. So it's a, it's a rolling submission window. So if you're interested, have um, July, August, September would be a prime time for submitting manuscripts um, and proposals. And um, through the you know, register report process, in principle acceptance, um, sometime later this year or, or early in 2023 would be most appropriate and expected. Can you remind us what's the, the latest people can submit um, if they wanted to? Right now, the I think <laughs> is it the end of the year? <laughs> you put my slide. I have to double check now. Yeah, and and also Zoltan, what's the so you said that for the registered report itself, then there is a kind of guaranteed timeline um, with the submission, at least for the first round of reviews. Schedule. That's for the schedule. That's a particular sort of submission. Okay. Um, the, the scheduled review submission. Do bear in mind that as author, you are guaranteeing that you're going to get this done. By, by the time window we give you, say um, five weeks. 
if you don't make that, then all bets are off. It's, it goes back to being a ordinary ordinary submission. Right. So, right. so you, you you gain from it in terms of the quickness of the turnaround process, but you're committing yourself to getting something written up in a certain time. So it's not. So there's there's, there's costs and benefits um, to you. Summer 2023 is the absolute deadline um, by which um, we w- we would close the better, application. Yeah. Or until um, funds are are um, exhausted, perhaps before then, by the end of this year. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Liv, for reminding me. Um, so someone said, "Can they do estimation?" Just, just to reiterate what I said, I, yeah. I, I did. I did focus on testing hypotheses, but also mentioned estimation as a possible thing for register before. Um, so yes, you could do a register report estimating some relevant um, parameters. And in kind of more kind of technical question as well, Manuel Hausch is asking what proportion of fund is funds is only distributed at the end. I think the funding will come at the time of the acceptance of the register reports. Am I correct? They you are correct. correct. Um, answer a couple. Um, are there any humanity specific journals too? Um, uh, th- there are no humanity specific journals, um, but several of the interdisciplinary ones uh, that are PCI friendly um, are, are likely to have um, humanities relevance. Um, yeah, someone says that said on the figure that some funds are distributed only at the end. That's what I thought I read as well. At, at the end of the stage one review process is when funds are distributed. Was there... And if I convey any mistaken information, we will correct that in writing. To all I think it was, it meant at the end of the reviewing uh, processes. But that, mean all funds, but that means all funds are distributed once you've got IPA and it's been awarded, yeah. you can get all the funds, That's right. it, as you understand it now. Yeah. yeah. Another relevant question, how many applications can a researcher make? <laughs> there's, there's no... Uh, pre-specified limit. Um, that's a very good question. We, we, we have no regulation against multiple submissions. Um, I, I would encourage focusing on, on, on one submission, at, at least one submission at a time. Someone asked about non-physical theories of consciousness. Um, in the end, it has to fit the, the journal remit. So that's really a question of, of, of the journals that we listed there. What would fit with those journals? So I and think, so again, it's the registered report constraints that will yes. dictate mostly, and the, the scope of the journal, um, that will dictate the feasibility. Am I correct, Zoltan? Um, yes. Um, I, I mean, on psychology of consciousness, as, as editor, I am dealing with a parapsychology experiment. Uh, so psychology of consciousness does deal with testing on physical theories. Um, yeah, so, so look at the journals that we've listed there and see what, what, what things they publish along the lines that you're thinking of. I, 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 and I don't know if there's anything more that from Templeton or... Cross A to C point of view, you say about that. No, it, I mean it's mostly within um, kind of the expectations of of um, what's publishable or, or, or what's presentable um, at the um, Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. The the, the remit of the work um, conducted within that community is the remit that we are focusing on. Yeah, so parapsychology doesn't actually fall into that. I think that would be. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I, I agree. I, I, I don't expect that to be so. There is another um, good question. A question about, about, oh. Sorry. So, um, 
systematic reviews and meta-analysis approaches, um, would that be appropriate? I think that would, but again, only in the registered reports format, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is doable, but probably less uh, common, Sultan? Exactly. There have been registered report meta-analyses, um, but far less common. Um, exactly. There, there is an issue, which I didn't mention, that um, in PCIR, we, with registered reports, we have different levels of bias control. So the standard, the standard registered report, the data has not been collected yet. And, 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 and then you get your, your uh, approval to run the study and you collect the data and then you analyze it. Um, but we do at PCIRR deal with other cases where there is the data out there, but, but there can be different degrees of control over whether you've seen it yet, whether it's available yet, whether you could possibly have time to analyze it in the way that you're thinking of analyzing it, which would be relevant to meta-analysis. Um, so from PCIRR point of view, it, it's fine to deviate from the strict criterion of the data is not there yet. Yes, the data could be there yet, as long as there's some level of control, and then we judge what that level of control is and give it a bias rating uh, accordingly. But I don't know if from the ASSC or cost point of view, you want to say anything about any issues to do with that. Uh, I think again, for following the guidelines of the journal and the registered report would be, I think would be fine for the SSC, uh, even if the data is already exists. Mm -hmm. There is one question, David, about what uh, for what purpose can the fund be used? So, is it possible to cover researcher PhD salaries? Um, we encourage most funds to be um, participant support or research material support, um, and we discourage a majority of funds to be used for um, salary. But it's not uh, a requirement one way or the other. So PhD salary probably would be difficult. It's, it's, it's permissible. Okay, but permissible. But research assistance, for instance, would be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. And there's another question about timeline as well, David. Um, if the pre-submission is positive, should the stage one journal review with in principle acceptance um, should be also completed at the end of 2022 to ensure available funds. Um, so I think the idea is that the submission for the per registered report should be happening op hopefully in 2022, but then yeah. obviously you still have more time. Um, the pre-submission inquiry takes two weeks. Um, <laughs> That, that's the expected maximum for that. That mm -hmm. is a, a relatively quick check um, so that we can have accounting of um, budget expectations and the appropriate scope. Uh, but, but most of the time can and should be during that in principle, or that, rather that stage one review process. Um, and so focusing on, on late summer 2022, early fall 2022 for submission of stage one proposed manuscripts is the expectation. Right. But if the review process would take there longer, take that, months, yeah. that wouldn't uh, affect the availability of funding, hopefully. It, it should not. And, and that's what we will be um, keeping an eye on closely during that timeline. Mm -hmm. We are coming up on time, meaning um, at time, <laughs> we will be saving a record of all the questions that have come in and double checking that we've answered them all correctly. I'll be double checking the question on, on the fund distribution um, and just to make sure that we're not distributing any fake news. So um, uh, if uh, any additional instructions will come either through your email and or the COS uh, website. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for our panelists and partners for your help and support. Thank you. Cheers.